Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Adler, Editor-in-Chief of Reuters, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Reuters Newsmaker event with former Vice President, climate activist, and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Al Gore. And Vice President Gore, we're so delighted uh, to have you with us, and particularly at a time that, frankly, is so momentous and perilous uh, in our history. So uh, thanks for being here. Um, so the format's going to be Basically, I'm going to ask uh, a bunch of questions, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience uh, to enable you to ask questions, and you'll see how to do that. Um, but first of all, I do want to turn this over uh, to an introduction uh, from, um, I've got to say, my mentor, uh, journalistic giant, one of the greatest journalists of all time, and I'm proud to say Reuters editor at large, uh, Sir Harold Evans. And he's going to say a few words at the outset, and he will pose the first question. So over to Harry. Thank you, Steve. Welcome, everyone. Today, we have a guest who is speaking the inconvenient truth with extraordinary foresight for a very long time. Former Vice President and Nobel Laureate Al Gore. He warned of the ticking time bomb on environmental crisis long before others understood it, much less had the political courage to say. In awarding him the Nobel Peace Prize now 13 years ago, the Nobel Committee recognized him as probably the greatest single individual who has done the most to create worldwide understanding of climate change. Today, his work carries on through his climate reality project which trains climate activists worldwide. Now, as the COVID-19 pandemic has its all in its deadly grip, he has written another forceful op-ed calling for sustainable capitalism and arguing that this global crisis should be viewed as an opportunity, a once-in-a-century obligation to rethink the relationship among business markets, government, and society. He joins us now from Tennessee. Welcome to this Reuters Forum, Al. And before Steve Adler drills down, let me ask you the first question. Climate, COVID-19 has driven climate change from the top of the news agenda. Agree? Tell us why you think the topic is so crucially relevant during this global pandemic. So, uh, Mr. Gore, again, wel welcome again. And uh, we're delighted to have you here with uh, what seems to be some sort of uh, universal image behind you. And uh, maybe you'll explain to us what that is. Um, let's pick up on Harry's question. Uh, why should we be paying attention to climate change right now when so many people, and it's now up over, I think, 177,000 in the U.S. are dying from COVID-19. Why climate change? Why should we be talking about that? Well, thank you, Steve. And thank you, Harry, for your generous words during that uh, introduction and uh, for putting your finger on the question of the moment, uh, the nexus between COVID-19 and the climate crisis. First of all, uh, it would be surprising if this pandemic were not uh, fully occupying our awareness uh, right now with uh, all of the deaths and all of the uh, suffering. But I don't think it's a zero-sum uh, contest uh, for our attention. I actually think these uh, two crises are very closely related. They have two similarities and two important uh, differences, Steve. Uh, first of all, um, the, the pandemic reminds us that when the leading scientists who understand the most about the challenges we face are setting their hair on fire, so to speak, and trying to warn us of an impending disaster, it's best to pay attention. And for quite a few years, uh, the best epidemiologists and virologists ha have been loudly warning us of a pandemic almost identical to the one that we're now struggling to overcome now, so when the climate scientists have been warning us for much longer of an even worse catastrophe uh, uh, because of the greenhouse gases disrupting uh, the climate balance and much else besides, 
uh, we need to pay attention to them. Um, this, the second uh, similarity uh, is that both the pandemic and the climate crisis reveal the pre-existing uh, inequities, uh, the structural and institutional racism, uh, the inequalities uh, and the uh, unfairness uh, in the structure and makeup of our economy and our society. Uh, because in the case of the pandemic, uh, the death rate among black Americans is 2.2 uh, .2 times uh, higher, and actually that understates uh, the differential uh, impact. Uh, and the climate crisis, as Pope Francis and many others have been pointing out for years, uh, affects the poor and, and communities of color and the disadvantaged and persecuted first and worst. And if we had been more aware of their plight years ago, it could have given us uh, a more uh, a vivid warning of what is in store for everyone else in the world. Now, here are the two differences. First of all, as the Secretary General of the United Nations has pointed out, the effects of this pandemic are measured in months and years, whereas the impacts of the climate crisis are measured in centuries, and if we don't get our act together, in millennia. Uh, and the other difference is, is also really Im important. We have had a partial shutdown of many economies in order to try to overcome the pandemic. So many jobs have been lost, at least temporarily. Some of them, unfortunately, may not come back, so we have to create new ones. And where the uh, climate crisis is concerned, we don't have to shut down uh, the economy. We can open the the, the uh, job creating engine of the sustainability revolution. The fastest growing job in the United States is solar installer. For the last five years, those jobs have grown five times faster than average job growth. The second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. Uh, the Oxford Review of Economics uh, just came out a few weeks ago with Joe Stiglitz and Lord Stern and others, uh, some of the very best economists in the world. Uh, pointing out that investments in renewable energy and sustainability approaches uh, dollar for dollar create three times as many jobs as investments in uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. So um, these uh, crises are braided together and the solution for the climate crisis can help us address the underlying uh, issues that both reveal. Yeah, and, and thank you. And, and you kind of open up to so many follow-up questions, I hardly know where to begin. But the, the first thing I'd ask you is, uh, when we were talking about Zika way back, you saw a cause and effect relationship uh, with the you know, warming climate and, and the, the changes in climate and how it affected the mosquitoes. Do you see any cause and effect relationship uh, between the, the changing climate, the extreme weather, uh, and other aspects of climate change and the, the sort of the advent of, of the virus? Well, yes, uh, I'd mention uh, two important ones. First of all, we now know from multiple studies that the burning of fossil fuels uh, should be understood as a precondition for higher death rates from uh, COVID-19. A massive study of 324 cities in China uh, showed a significant uh, linear increase uh, in infections and serious infections related to uh, cities and communities where there is more particulate pollution in the air. Of course, the principal source of that uh, is burning fossil fuels. When we burn uh, coal and gas and oil, it creates uh, carbon dioxide, which is the principal cause of the climate crisis. But at the same time, it creates what some people call conventional uh, air pollution. The scientists uh, refer to 2.5 ppm. Uh, the so small particulates, the soot, uh, and the small particles go deep uh, in the lung. Uh, the Harvard School of Public Health uh, came out with, with uh, a warning that more burning of fossil fuels actually does create the same higher infection rate and higher death rate uh, in, in the United States. Uh, the same thing happened uh, with SARS. Uh, in, in Italy uh, uh, and Spain, the areas with the most infections, 78% uh, of them were in the most polluted areas. They even went back and looked at the 1918-1919 flu pandemic uh, and correlated the deaths there with the amount of coal that was burned 
right. in those cities, they found an 11% increase uh, in infant mortality rate and a 10% increase in overall mortality rate with even a moderate increase in air pollution. And I'm sorry to go on too long, but you've asked an important question. Let me get to the second uh, part of the answer, Steve. Uh, we are encountering now five new infectious diseases uh, every year. And three quarters of them are called zoonotic diseases, which uh, I, I now know uh, it, it means they come from animals to humans. Yeah. And of course, th that's where SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, came from, from, from bats uh, in a region near Wuhan. Uh, and that's uh, happening because we are steadily encroaching more and more into the wild, previously wild areas right. of the world where there are literally millions of viruses that human beings have not encountered. Uh, now, uh, the, the consequences of the climate crisis in disrupting the water cycle, creating storms like the one headed toward the US coast right now, uh, uh, creating the fires like those that are raging in California uh, and Nevada uh, right now uh, in Oregon, uh, actually shift the balance along mainly with the higher temperatures in the relationship between humans and microbes. And they shift the balance in favor of, of microbes. We're seeing tropical diseases move forward, north in the Northern Hemisphere, south in the Southern Hemisphere. And air travel has a lot to do with that. But, but the places where they take root and become endemic uh, is very much affected by the changed climate conditions where these uh, viruses uh, uh, travel. Um, very, very helpful on that point. Let's, let's just get to remedies for a moment. So you mentioned at the outset that the uh, kind of both climate change and COVID-19 are hitting poorer communities um, and communities of color uh, much harder. And there's been a lot of talk about, okay, we, we now have an opportunity perhaps to do something, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's uh, do, doing different, kind of looking at how we organize ourselves as a community differently to try to bridge those gaps. Do you have any specific suggestions about how to kind of use the combined uh, effects of these two uh, events to racism, uh, we've, we've got to get past this. Uh, and both uh, the, the pandemic and the climate crisis do have this uh, differential impact. In, in uh, the, the case of the pandemic, uh, of course, unequal access to health care uh, among Black Americans, also Native Americans, the highest infection rate is in the Navajo Nation. Uh, but Black Americans are, are self suffering the brunt of the deaths and uh, illnesses. Uh, and some of that is due to pre-existing inequities. Well before the pandemic, uh, Black children uh, suffer from asthma three times more, and the death rate among Black children from asthma is 10 times higher than the death rate uh, among white children. Similarly, if you, uh, the, the fact that uh, black Americans are less likely to have zoomable uh, jobs. If you look yeah. at the cohort, the age group between 35 and 44, black Americans of that age are dying from the pandemic uh, 10 times more than white Americans 35 to 44. Uh, there, there is the, the wealth gap. It, it is shocking that the average black family has less than one tenth the wealth uh, of the average white family. It takes 11 and a half average black families to make up the family wealth of one average uh, white family. Uh, now, where environmental justice is concerned, uh, black communities of color are way more likely to be downwind from the smokestacks and downstream from the hazardous waste flows and adjacent to coal ash sites and hazardous chemical waste sites because due to institutional and structural racism, they have been deprived of the same political and economic ability to defend themselves against the location of fossil fuel infrastructure and the petrochemical complexes uh, and, 
As a result, they are victimized by it. Look at uh, Cancer Alley, about an hour north of where Hurricane Laura is due to hit tomorrow, uh, where, where you have a, a, a very elevated uh, cancer rate because that's where they put these uh, plastics and petrochemicals and refineries. And you try to put one of those in a wealthy white uh, suburb near uh, New York City or London or Washington, D.C., you're not going to be able to do it. But they pick these locations where they realize in advance they're not going to face the same kind of, uh, uh, of opposition due to the, the, the uh, deprivation of yeah. that political and economic power. Yeah. So I'm going to switch away for a moment from uh, both COVID and climate change. I promise to come back because I have additional questions on that topic. But I just want to talk a little politics with you, which I think is only fair. You won the popular vote for president in the year 2000 uh, uh, with, with an outcome that didn't quite get you uh, into the Oval Office. Um, but so I want to ask you a few questions. First of all, are you watching the conventions and do you have any observations on the Democratic and the Republican conventions so far? I thought the Democratic convention was a stunning success. Of course, I'm biased, uh, and so I, I don't qualify as a focus group. But uh, most of the focus groups and even uh, some of the uh, analysts on Fox News uh, gave the Democrats credit for having a real success at that convention. And Joe Biden's speech was spectacular. Again, in my admittedly prejudiced view, I, I thought he did a fantastic job. We'll have to see how the rest of the Republican convention goes. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm, uh, again, uh, even a, a less fair judge of how they're doing. OK, so you don't want to comment on the GOP convention right now? Well, we've had the first night. Uh, it, it didn't seem as uh, joyful and uplifting as the president promised us it was going to be. It was pretty, pretty dark and depressing at times. But uh, I understand they're trying to make uh, their case, and uh, when you, uh, as the old lawyer uh, cliche has it, ha has, has it, if you have the facts, uh, uh, argue the facts. If you have the law, argue the law. If you have neither, uh, shout and bang the table. I, I think there was a lot of shouting last night. Okay. Um, back to the Democrats. Uh, obviously, you were vice president for eight years. Um, what did you think of the choice of Kamala Harris as uh, vice president? And have you spoken to her, given her any kind of suggestions about the role? I certainly have spoken to her, but not since uh, she was chosen. I think she, uh, she's been a little busy since then, <laughs> but I have spoken to her uh, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, I thought it was a brilliant choice. Uh, I think since uh, the murder of George Floyd and the incredible uh, outpouring of uh, the reaction and the demand for change and reform uh, really did uh, create a new reality. Uh, in this country, a and uh, selecting a woman of color uh, was something uh, Joe Biden decided he wanted to do. And luckily, he had a number of fantastic mm -hmm. choices. And uh, as attorney general of the largest state in the union, managing uh, that enormous uh, organization in California as an extremely effective senator, as a champion of solving the climate crisis and a particular champion of dealing with climate uh, injustice. Uh, I, I think she, I think she, uh, she was a terrific choice. And, and are you feeling okay at this point about uh, Vice President Biden's climate policy? I know there were people who felt it wasn't strong enough during the, during the primary campaign. I am feeling uh, great about it, actually. I've had a, quite a number of conversations with, uh, with uh, Vice President Biden, especially since uh, he secured the nomination and his climate policies in the primaries was good uh, and actually uh, more forward leaning than any uh, of the prior campaign uh, cycles. But some of his opponents uh, leaned forward a bit more. And after he secured the nomination, he wisely reached out and incorporated uh, many, not all, but many uh, of, of the proposals that his opponents had advocated. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, he really has by far the strongest climate uh, agenda that we have ever seen mm -hmm. uh, in, in a campaign in this country. And actually, uh, this, this is not hyperbole, Steve. If you look mm -hmm. carefully at his economic plan, it, it's obvious that uh, a green recovery and solutions to the climate crisis 
are at the heart of his economic plan. Going to zero carbon electricity generation by 2035 uh, is ambitious, uh, aggressive, greatly needed, and I think we, we definitely can and will achieve it, uh, but that's just one example, and I could go through the other planks in his uh, personal platform, uh, and they're, they're all that way. Uh, he, he is really leaning into this crisis, and I'm very proud of what he's proposing to do. Okay, so, so, so let's jump ahead to November 3rd and jump back to the fall of uh, 2000. Um, I, I watched, I uh, rewatched your concession uh, speech and I was struck by how kind of confident and forceful you were in saying, look, it's over, it's time to move on, this country needs, needs to move on. And there were potentially some other moves that, that could have been taken. I, I guess the first question I'd ask is, have you ever had second thoughts about uh, conceding? Well, first of all, when you say there were potentially some other moves, I, I researched them, and it turns out there's no uh, intermediate step between a final Supreme Court decision and violent revolution. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it, it seemed to me that respect for the rule of law uh, and respect for the needs of American uh, democracy uh, were the orders of the day. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I did feel that it was time to uh, recognize that a final Supreme Court decision uh, essentially ended. Uh, I mean, you can always uh, explore the option of dragging something out, tearing the country apart, mobilizing partisans against one another in the streets and all of that. But, but uh, it, it uh, was not a wise uh, course for, for our country, would not have been. So, so I think you know where I'm going from here next. Um, do you think if President Trump loses uh, in November, he will concede essentially in the same spirit that you conceded? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it's important to say that it's really not up to him. <laughs> and uh, I hear people saying, well, will he accept the decision? Well, it doesn't matter. He, it's not up to him. Uh, because at noon on January 20th, uh, if a new president is elected, I, I hope Joe Biden is elected, and if that is the case, uh, the, uh, the uh, police force, uh, the Secret Service, uh, <laughs> the military, all of the executive branch uh, officers will respond to the command and direction of the new president. Uh, and so it it will not matter uh, whether Donald Trump accepts it personally or not. I'm hoping uh, that it will be a decisive victory, but I don't want to get ahead of myself because like a lot of people in my uh, political party, uh, uh, I, I felt uh, kind of uh, optimistic uh, four years ago and we all saw what yeah. happened. And so I don't think anybody uh, who is a partisan for uh, Biden and Harris are going to be relaxing or coasting uh, just because they have a lead in the polls right now. This is going to be a turnout election, mm -hmm. uh, and Donald Trump's voters will turn out. Uh, he's lost some support in his base, but, but uh, he will have an historic turnout, I imagine. And so Democrats uh, have to have an even larger turnout. I'll give you an example, Steve. Uh, in the last uh, off-year election uh, for governor in the state of Kentucky, the incumbent Republican governor got 200,000 more votes in his bid for re-election than he did four years earlier. But the Democratic nominee got 300,000 more votes yeah. than uh, the previous nominee did. And I think that's the hopeful template that Democrats are trying to apply to this election. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I guess I want to challenge or, or question the sort of confidence you have that there will be a, a smooth and peaceful uh, transition. I, I think the, the uh, case that the Republicans and particularly Pres President Trump is, is starting to make is that the election would not be legitimate because there would be substantial fraud and there would be uh, just enough uh, mistakes in counting the ballots that he would, he would say that he was not, uh, he did not lose legitimately, he lost illegitimately, and therefore either there should be a new election or he should stay in office. Um, and I think that's the scenario that a lot of people are 
um, talking about right now. And uh, I mean, does that scenario sound plausible to you? Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, he, 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 he claimed the popular vote was illegitimate uh, four years ago. He won the Electoral College and lost the popular vote, and he went on with this nonsense about uh, millions of uh, uh, undocumented immigrants coming. It was just complete nonsense, just like his birther uh, slander against uh, former President Obama and his uh, stillborn efforts to pull the same stunt with Kamala Harris. He had to abandon that because mm -hmm. yeah. uh, e even his base said, now we've heard that song, we're ready for uh, something else. Uh, but he has signaled that uh, he will challenge the election uh, results. And yes, that's a concern. He, he yeah. seems to have no uh, compunctions at all about trying to rip apart the social fabric and the political equilibrium uh, of the American people. And he's uh, strategically planting doubts in advance uh, to try to undermine uh, people's confidence in the election. So Americans of whatever party uh, have to gird ourselves uh, to push back against this despicable uh, strategy that he's signaling. Uh, and of course, uh, during the middle of the pandemic, uh, old, millions of older Americans and lots of uh, uh, Americans of other ages with pre-existing conditions are scared that they can't breathe safely Right. Uh, if they stand in lines at polling at uh, crowded polling uh, places, and and so they want to vote by mail, uh, the studies show that voting by mail has never given an advantage to either uh, party. In most states, Republicans have taken the lead in pushing vote yeah. by mail. But during this pandemic, it may be different because of uh, the older Americans uh, who are more vulnerable to it. I noticed he said yesterday that the mailboxes uh, won't be swabbed down for COVID-19. Uh, and of course, he's uh, put in uh, his, uh, a lackey as a postmaster general. Uh, and to try to deprive people who are scared of the pandemic from voting by mail by dismantling the postal service, uh, he's attempting to put his knee on the neck of democracy. Uh, and in the process, create all of the doubts that he thinks might uh, come back uh, and, and help him by creating chaos and confusion, which is uh, the, uh, the milieu that he seems to prefer. So, so my, I, I don't want to dwell on this, but my stark last question on this is, do you think the constitutional system will hold? Yes, I, I do. Um, it has for a long time now, and uh, he has challenged uh, most all of our existing norms and undermined uh, the rule of law. Uh, but I'm very hopeful, and I would say confident that uh, it, it it will hold. But we have to prepare for this, Steve. Uh, with the increased number of mail-in ballots. Uh, there will be a longer period of time necessary to count all those votes. I heard uh, uh, Donald Trump say the other night, uh, we may not even know the election result on the, the night of November 3rd, on the night of the election. I thought, well, I've actually uh, uh, heard that and it's happened before, but there's an extra twist this time. It is possible that the apparent result uh, on election day may uh, point in one direction when the uh, mail-in ballots uh, are eventually counted, it, it, it may flip uh, very powerfully in the opposite direction. I, I think he's probably got some numbers uh, that uh, preview that possibility for him, uh, and, and that may explain why they're taking away the mailboxes and disassembling the mail shorting machines and cutting uh, out the overtime pay or a lot of it for the mail delivery uh, people. Uh, you know, the post office was uh, present at our founding. It's in the Constitution. Americans uh, what, of whatever party want to see the Postal Service uh, preserved. Uh, and he, I think he made a strategic mistake. He's going to bull forward with his strategy, I'm sure. But I think he's already finding that 
Uh, Republicans in the House and Senate are not eager to jump off this particular cliff with him. Yeah. yeah. So just to give the audience a sense of where we are, uh, we're about between 10 and 15 minutes away from my taking your questions. Your questions are coming in, frankly, by the hundreds, so I'm not going to get to all of them, but I, I, will, um, I will start asking them in uh, between 10 and 15 minutes. But, but I did want to turn to some uh, questions of tactics in the fight uh, against climate change. Um, and, and one issue that uh, I found very interesting, because I heard your speech at Harvard about uh, divestiture from uh, fossil fuel companies, and obviously you got a very, a very positive recep reception there. Um, and then coincidentally, I had a conversation with Bill Gates shortly afterwards, where he was arguing, he's arguing strenuously against uh, divesting, and he's written about it, divesting from fossil fuel companies, essentially saying they have all the capital they need, so you're not taking away their capital, um, and you need them. You need to be in partnership with them. They've got big, heavy machines that dig holes that can, you know, bury carbon, or you know, you want them on your side. So, can can you? talk that, um, that argument and explain why divestiture is important and why perhaps uh, Bill Gates' argument uh, isn't as sensible. Yeah, um, I remember one of the early uh, Walt Disney uh, cartoon movies called Fantasia, a classic. Uh, younger people in the audience may not remember it. Uh, but one of the scenes uh, that stuck with me as a child was a, a ballet scene where uh, a hippopotamus named Hyac Hyacinth was in a tutu uh, dancing on point, and it was difficult for a hippopotamus to dance ballet. Uh, in the same way, it's difficult for an oil and gas company to suddenly shift uh, towards sustainability uh, and building solar panels uh, and wind farms. Some of them uh, may be able to do it. BP just announced a 40% reduction in their fossil fuel production and a tenfold increase in renewable energy. They tried it once before uh, 15 years ago and it didn't work for them. I hope it will this time. But some of the others are, are still uh, uh, supporting uh, the climate denial movement. And, and you know, uh, for a long time, uh, ExxonMobil, uh, uh, which was probably the worst, and uh, some others uh, gave money uh, to uh, these uh, charlatans who pretend uh, that the climate crisis is not real. They took the playbook from the tobacco industry uh, back when the Surgeon General and the scientists uh, said smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer. They spent enormous amount of money uh, uh, hiring actors and dressing them up as doctors, putting them in front of the camera to say, hi, I'm a doctor and you don't have to worry about smoking cigarettes at all. Uh, and 100 million people died. Uh, now, they are using that same approach to try to falsely convince people that the climate crisis is not real. Now, the, most of the companies, particularly the European companies, have now shifted away uh, from that strategy. But the idea that the fossil fuel companies are going to solve this is utter nonsense. Yeah. Most of them put their advertisements on TV portraying themselves as champions of renewable energy and solving the climate crisis. And then you look uh, and see that 99% of their budget is still spent uh, looking for more oil and gas when the amount that they have uh, already proven out in their reserves, mark to market uh, at full value on their books, uh, most of two thirds of it, according to the International Energy Agency, is not gonna be burned, cannot be burned. Mm -hmm. uh, not because of uh, the treaty or, or laws, although that may play a role, uh, but because we are seeing a sustainability revolution, Steve, that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution with the speed of the digital revolution. We are seeing the kind of cost reduction curves for solar and wind and batteries and electric vehicles and thousands of hyper-efficiency technologies the same kind of a cost down curve that we saw with computer chips uh, and mobile phones and flat screen TVs. The response to R&D uh, leads to lower cost and simultaneously much higher quality. So uh, let me put it this way. Five years ago, electricity from solar and wind was cheaper than electricity from new coal and uh, gas uh, plants in 1% of the world. Today, 
renewable electricity is cheaper than fo new fossil electricity in two thirds of the world. And mm -hmm. five years from now, it will be cheaper in virtually 100% of the world. We're seeing the closing of these fossil fuel uh, plants. Uh, GE just announced uh, they're shutting down a natural gas generating plant in California 20 years ahead of schedule, replacing it with solar and batteries. Florida Power and Light uh, it, shutting down two natural gas generating plants, replacing it with solar uh, and batteries. We're seeing this happen all over the world. Last year, uh, calendar year 2019, if you look at all of the new electricity generation installed worldwide, 80% of it was solar and wind, and those numbers are still increasing. In Europe, it was 88%. There was no new coal generation uh, in the United States. And, and by the way, the famous coal museum north of where I am in uh, Kentucky, uh, they just install solar panels on their roof. So, so on that, just one more on that point, um, and again, not to use Bill Gates as a foil again, but uh, is this enough without nuclear? Is nuclear sort of really what we need to, uh, to get the level of uh, energy generation that gets you out of the fossil fuel world? Well, unfortunately, uh, I mean, I used to be a very enthusiastic supporter of nuclear. I represented Oak Ridge, where the industry began uh, uh, when I was a kid. Uh, and yet, I've been very disappointed. Uh, they have priced themselves out of the market. Electricity from nuclear power plants is now by far the most expensive electricity mm -hmm. uh, available in the world. Uh, put it another way, if you um, were the CEO of an electric utility and you wanted to build a new nuclear plant, uh, the first two questions you might ask your executive team are, number one, how much will this thing cost? And there is not a single engineering consulting firm in the United States or, or, or Europe who will sign their name on an opinion even giving an estimate. So the answer is, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. The second question is, okay, how long will it take to build it uh, before we can start selling the electricity? And again, the answer is, oh, we have, we have no idea whatsoever. So that might discourage you uh, from building a new nuclear power plant. Uh, and especially when you look at the fact that the electricity from renewables is, as I've said, continuing to go down. We have, we, we have now a number of utilities uh, in Texas that have a new rate plan uh, from 9 p.m. at night to 6 a.m. the next morning. Use all the electricity you want totally for free. Uh, it becomes zero marginal cost. And by the way, that is the reason uh, why uh, uh, Pete Altmaier and uh, Angela Merkel in Germany have just announced this green hydrogen proposal to replace coal uh, and coking coal for steel uh, with hydrogen produced by zero marginal cost uh, solar and wind. Wind in the North Sea and a massive solar farm they're planning for Morocco and another one in Nigeria. So last question from me, although I had many, many more, because I do want to get to the audience questions. But a lot of people are asking themselves, should they be doing things themselves, putting policy aside, um, that make a difference? Not eating meat, reducing your own carbon footprint, uh, you know, being um, good about recycling, even though, you, frankly, you're not absolutely sure it's really going to a recycling plant. How, how much does individual behavior actually matter, sort of, quantitatively in terms of helping with climate change? Um, and do you think people should pay a lot of attention to how they're handling carbon and uh, in their own lifestyle? Well, sure, everybody uh, can, can make uh, a difference. And our, all the doctors say uh, we'd all be better off eating less meat, particularly less uh, red meat. And uh, the climate impact of animal agriculture is large. Uh, recycling, and it's a mess right now. I, I'm agreeing with what you were saying about uh, how we feel about it. Uh, but paying attention uh, to the climate-friendly and environmental-friendly options in the marketplace, that sends a signal uh, up the supply chain, uh, the distribution chain to manufacturers and designers, and that, that's uh, making a difference. But here is a really important point, Steve. They're part of the propaganda campaign of the fossil fuel complex uh, several years ago was designed to try to shift the burden 
to every single person as an individual. What individuals can do that's most important is in their capacity as citizens and voters to demand changes in policy. We need new policies and we need new policy makers. And the kind of movement that Greta Thunberg uh, and, and her uh, uh, generation is, is demanding is exactly what we need. Uh, we need a massive shift in policies to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. The world now forces taxpayers around the world to subsidize the burning of fossil fuels at a rate 38 times greater than the meager subsidies to speed up the transition to renewables. So yes, what we do in our lives makes a difference, but what we do in our democracies makes a much bigger difference. We need to vote. We need to speak up. We need to convince others to support this movement within our political and governmental structures. Great. Well, thank you. Let me get to as many questions as I can. But let me start with one from Sir Harry, and, and then we'll move uh, to other people. So Harry asks, what has been the concrete impact of leaving the Paris Accord? And if Biden rejoins, how fast or is it even possible to remedy the lost four years? Well, first of all, uh, under the law, international and US, the United States cannot leave the Paris Agreement until uh, November 4th, the day after this uh, upcoming election. Uh, Donald Trump stated his intention to do that, but the same legal provisions uh, say that a new president could give 30 days notice and then the US would be right back in the agreement. Uh, and uh, Vice President Biden has said that if he is elected, he will do that uh, on his first day as president. Uh, we have uh, lost, uh, not entirely, but we, we've lost uh, uh, some of these last uh, four years, but we have seen the majority of people in the United States living in states that are actually moving faster than the Paris Agreement uh, on their own led by uh, uh, Washington State, Jay Inslee, uh, California, Oregon, New York, New Jersey, we're seeing a massive movement. And cities around the United States, uh, a lot of them have made a commitment to 100% renewable uh, energy. Uh, quite a few of them have already achieved that goal. And we've seen the business sector moving very powerfully. If you look at the statistics on uh, the amount of clean renewable electricity from corporate purchase agreements. That's one of the things that's driving this renewable revolution. So um, when we add to this momentum that has continued new policies that will really accelerate the transition, there is still time uh, to solve this crisis before it, it reaches its catastrophic stage. Uh, damage has already been done. Uh, and more will be done, but we still can't avoid the worst of the consequences. And as I said earlier, by tackling this challenge, we can put tens of millions of uh, people to work uh, in communities where they live. We need to pay attention to a just transition. Coal miners didn't create uh, this cry. They're not the ones uh, to be blamed or held responsible for it. We owe them thanks for their work and creating the civilization we have, uh, and we owe them job training and new jobs uh, in the communities uh, that they call home. Great. So these questions, since they're from the audience, will bounce around a bit. So uh, it may make your brain uh, uh, gotta, gotta jump, jump a bit. But um, the, the first question is, do you think America is in the middle of a civil war politically, what would it take to end it? Or are the 50 states headed for some sort of split from each other eventually? No, I don't think so. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, has been orchestrating uh, a strategy to try to rip the United States apart and wherever um, uh, he finds uh, a, a place to drive in a wedge, uh, he's doing it. Uh, of course, the uh, bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee uh, report uh, just a few days ago confirmed that there was actual collaboration uh, between Donald Trump and, and the Russians. I'm not sure they use that exact word, uh, collusion, collaboration, but the facts that they uh, presented, uh, signed by the Republicans as well as the Democrats, 
make it clear that's exactly uh, what happened. Um, we have had um, 40 years of um, middle income families in the US and most of the developed world see no uh, significant increase in take home pay. And over that same period of time, the wealthiest 1% or 0.1% has just gone uh, through the stratosphere, uh, getting wealthier and wealthier. Um, you know, inequality is a little bit like inflation. You're always going to have a, a little bit. You need a little bit. It's a precondition for the incentives that unlock uh, a higher fraction of the human potential in capitalist uh, economies. But like inflation, we have to avoid at all costs hyper inequality. Hyper inflation destroys economies. Hyper inequality destroys both capitalism and democracy. So uh, in healing the divisions that you referred to in the premise of your question, mm -hmm. we have to address these underlying causes, another of which is the long overdue effort to address the structural and institutional racism that we just saw on display apparently uh, in another Wisconsin uh, city uh, yesterday. Uh, and we, 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 have to, we have to deal with all of these problems that have made us vulnerable to those who want to tear the country apart. Okay, uh, back to a climate question. And, and this is essentially saying that uh, while extreme weather events would certainly suggest um, climate change and be a, a way for climate advocates to show that there, there are actual changes, um, people who are more climate deniers or are raising questions basically say correlation isn't the same as causation. And kind of relatedly, there was a, a Pew poll that said that um, only 20% of Republicans believe human activity contributes a great deal uh, to climate change. And that was regardless of how much scientific knowledge they had. So sort of putting those two, two, two things together, how do you deal with, uh, I guess, the, the sense that there are still people who, who don't see the correlation and who are, don't see even the extreme weather as meaning that we're in a climate change situation? Well, I think uh, Mother Nature has now joined the debate, uh, and it's a little more difficult to use uh, sophistry when you get five feet of rain, as they did in Houston with Hurricane Harvey, as the Bahamas did with Hurricane Dorian, uh, as the uh, uh, Sundarbans area of Bangladesh and India uh, got with that e enormous uh, typhoon, that cyclone that just uh, hit them. When you have uh, uh, some of the biggest fires in, in recorded history raging right now as we're speaking uh, in California, uh, when you see these events, we've had 18 once in a thousand year downpours uh, just in the last 10 years here in the United States. And, and the cause is not mysterious. <laughs> it's been known for a long time. Uh, every single day, we are spewing more than 150 million tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution into the atmosphere. Uh, you asked about this backdrop earlier. This is, from the, this is a NASA picture from the space station, uh, and, and this shows how thin uh, the atmosphere is. We look up at the blue sky, and it seems like a vast and limitless expanse. But if you could drive a car straight up in the air at interstate highway speeds, you get to the top of the sky in about five minutes. Uh, the top of the sky is where the blue gives way to the black and yep. where you can't, you can no longer breathe oxygen unassisted and where the greenhouse gas layer tops out. We're using this very narrow space, this thin shell that surrounds our planet as an open sewer for dumping all of this heat trapping pollution. And it stays there a long time. On average, CO2 molecules uh, linger there for 100 years. And the cumulative amount now is trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every single day. How long will it take before some of those deniers who are following their chosen leaders realize that we are behaving unethically, 
immorally and self-destructively uh, and imposing upon ourselves, not to mention future generations, horrific consequences. We can stop this. We are now crossing the political tipping point. That's the good news. I gave you some of the statistics earlier, but we still need the policy changes because the fossil fuel industries have a hundred years of political and economic influence and political networks and lobbyists and revolving door appointees. A coal lobbyist is running the Environmental Protection Agency now, courtesy of Donald Trump. And almost all of these uh, environmental uh, agencies and departments are now in the clutches of the largest polluters. I'm hoping that will change on January 20th of next Right, and, and actually wonderful segue to the next question sitting here on my queue which is, would you accept a role in the Biden-Harris administration? And if so, what would you like it to be? I, well, thank you for asking the question. And in many ways, that's an attractive proposition. But in many ways, for me, it's not. I'm a recovering politician. The, the longer I go without a relapse, the less likely. around the world starting this Friday. 10,000 uh, applied uh, uh, for the training that I completed last month. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm continuing those efforts. And in the business world, as a, as a co-founder and chairman of Generation Investment Management, uh, my partners and I uh, are uh, proving the business case that if you fully integrate sustainability and ESG factors in the investment process, you can outperform. Uh, and that's one of, and of course, the studies now indicate that that, that is the case. Uh, asset managers that don't do it are in danger of violating their fiduciary responsibility to their clients. And we're seeing a massive shift uh, in that direction. Uh, and, and so these activities uh, in, uh, in uh, civic action, grassroots uh, activity and in the business world are, are ones that feel uh, uh, fulfilling and appropriate uh, for me to uh, apply myself to uh, right now. And I should mention and ask you about one of your newer initiatives where, as I understand it, you're using AI and other techniques to trace um, where our carbon emissions are actually coming from. And can you talk a little bit about that? And also, are you going planning to identify the specific provider uh, of those emissions so that, in a, in a sense, uh, outing or shaming um, people who are creating large, uh, large emissions? Uh, yes, but it's not just uh, shaming. There are a lot of uh, companies that have emissions that would like to have more accurate and uh, real-time information uh, uh, to measure the progress they want to make in reducing them. There are a lot of governments who really don't know uh, all the places where their emissions are coming from. And there's certainly a lot of uh, climate activists uh, around the world and investors and businesses that want their supply chains to be carbon free who want this information. And yes, uh, uh, I am uh, uh, a part of a coalition uh, that has uh, nine uh, tech uh, groups and companies uh, that are filled with these uh, experts in AI and machine learning and very sophisticated uh, technological uh, uh, tools. Uh, by next June, uh, we, we will make available to the world, open source, uh, a full accounting of every human-caused emission of greenhouse gases all around the world. And yes, we will identify it uh, uh, by location, in real time, uh, those who are responsible for it, and we will update most of it every six hours. And by painting uh, uh, the world transparent uh, in the sense that we will be able to see in real time where this stuff is coming from, then uh, it, that will create a completely new reality. I'm very excited about it, Climate Trace. Trace 
stands for Tracking Real-Time Atmospheric Carbon Emissions. Uh, and I'm very great. Gavin McCormick is one of my partners uh, in this, and I could name uh, the leaders of the other nine groups uh, as well if we had time. Uh, we're working very hard on it. We're very excited about it. Great. A couple more questions. Um, this question is generally about science. Um, science seems to be in the year 2020 to be surprisingly controversial. There are people who will claim that the Earth is flat, um, people who obviously deny uh, climate research, people who on health and diet related issues, um, there are people who deny evolution. What is it about science and our culture right now that's making it uh, as controversial and as difficult for people to accept what would ordinarily be viewed as established science? Well, one of my classmates as an undergraduate went on to become the longtime dean of Yale Law School, Robert Post, a brilliant guy. Uh, and he made a speech in when he, which he said, uh, what's under attack is the authority of knowledge. I wrote a book uh, several years ago uh, called The Assault on Reason. When, when facts that illuminate what is more likely to be true than not leads to decisions that are inconvenient for powerful interests that have political and economic connections, they are tempted to try to squash the facts, to try to challenge the authority of knowledge, to launch an assault on the reasoning that leads people uh, to different conclusions that are not in their interest. But what has made the United States, uh, pardon the pride, uh, the greatest country in the world, is that until uh, not too long ago, we made better decisions than any other nation by relying on the collective wisdom of the American people, harvesting the wisdom of crowds uh, through the regular election process. But uh, some of these uh, powerful moneyed interests have tried to disrupt that process uh, and impose their preferred policies that will further enrich them and empower them at the expense of everyone else. So we're, we're very close to closing, and I do want to ask you a question that I think about a lot. Um, and that is, you know, as a, as a species, um, are we equipped, are, are we built, are we programmed to look out a number of years at these long-term issues and stay focused on them so that we can make progress on them. And there's this term, um, I was reading uh, generational amnesia, the notion that uh, people just get used to the way it is. You're, you're going to forget that it's not always 95 or 100 degrees or that your, your uh, Miami is always being flooded. Um, and you're just going to start accepting it. And we're going to be working on mitigation and creating levees and, and, and dams. But we're not, we're not going to have the sustained capability of focusing on the issue because that's kind of not what we were created, you know, what we evolved to do. I mean, just what's your thought on that? Because you've always been so optimistic. I'd just love to hear you kind of frame your optimism as against that concern. Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, let me say, I think that we need to be uh, cautious about too easily accepting uh, false neoliberal optimism uh, and a Pollyanna view that everything is going to be fine no matter what. But, but uh, we also have to avoid the pessimistic conclusion that some uh, uh, have, uh, and you, the premise of your question gets at this. Uh, decades ago, a, a scientist used a geeky phrase uh, uh, in saying uh, to me, he said, Al, what's uh, being tested here is whether or not the combination of an opposable thumb and a neocortex is a viable combination right. on this planet. Uh, and it's quite right that we uh, carry with us uh, the evolutionary legacy of our long period of development and creation uh, in that we respond readily to the kinds of threats that our ancient ancestors appeared. Uh, the flashing of a big cat's uh, uh, teeth, a snake, uh, or other humans with clubs uh, for a lot of our that was the biggest threat for a long period. But in spite of our limiting factors, we also have the ability to transcend our limitations and rise above 
of the weaker parts of our nature. And we have seen this done repeatedly in the past when the chips were down and we had to rise to the occasion. If you look at the effort to uh, abolish slavery, there were long periods when the advocates felt despair. Uh, if you look at the struggle for women's suffrage, and here we are in the 100th anniversary uh, this week of the women's suffrage uh, success here in the United States. Again, many thought that would be impossible. The civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement, more recently the gay and lesbian uh, uh, equality movement. But all of those movements eventually succeeded. Uh, Wallace Stevens, uh, the great poet who was a businessman before he devoted himself entirely to poetry, once, once wrote, uh, after the last no comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. We have the ability together to chart a course into the future that's manifestly better for us and our progeny. We know how to do it. We can do it. And for any who actually are tempted to the pessimistic view that we just lack the political will necessary, remember that political will is itself a renewable resource. Well, that's as good a place to end as any. Uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it was highly illuminating, and thank everybody for participating. And um, we're, we're out. So thanks again. Thanks to you, and thanks to Harry. Thanks to Harry.